All right, good morning, Bar Camp Online. Everybody wave. Thank you very much. Now I want you to help me out with something. I'm not Steve, I'm not Steve Hardy or Jeff Jobs, <laughs> no matter what Dusty says, right? But I am also not definitively Steve Jobs. So you all help me out and you say with me, Jeff Hardy is not Steve Jobs. Jeff Hardy is not Steve Jobs. Thank you very much. Now it's really important that we talk about that. That's the whole. Who, who thought they knew what they were coming in for when they saw the topic? Anyone? Total mystery, right? The point is, I'm totally comfortable not being Steve Jobs, but I don't think a lot of people are. So I think my employees sometimes think I think I'm Steve Jobs because we push ourselves pretty hard. But that has nothing to do with, with, with the reality of the situation. So we're going to talk a little bit about this. Now, i got a book coming out. It's called Not Steve Jobs. Lots of different chapters. But we're going to focus on one aspect of that today. We're going to talk about why your boss, why your boss. Who has a boss? Okay, who, who, all right, if everybody didn't raise their hand, because even if you were your own boss, your customer is still your boss. So once again, who has a boss? Perfect. Your boss is not Steve Jobs. We're going to focus on that today. Whether he knows it or not, your boss is not Steve Jobs. But when we talk about Steve Jobs, we have to ask ourselves, is that even the right question to ask? Right? Because does it really matter who Steve Jobs is or was? Does it matter? Because the message is, it's who you are, Jesse. It's who you are, right? Where does the myth of Steve Jobs, we're surrounded by this today. We're going to talk a lot about that. We are surrounded by the mythos of Steve Jobs. Everybody is quoting Steve Jobs today. I do it. I find myself doing it compulsively. News stories, books, movies. I got to, how about this? We'll do this together. Ashton Kutcher is not Steve Jobs. Ashton Kutcher is not Steve Jobs, right? Everybody's giving you their impression of Steve Jobs. We're building up this myth. Now, Steve Jobs famously converted to Buddhism, all right? If, if, if that's possible, because Buddhism is a philosophy, not necessarily a religion. But if you can convert to Buddhism, he claims that he did that. I do not doubt him. But Buddha himself said something rather important to his students. He said, do not worship me. Do not make a god of me. But ultimately, that's what all of his followers did, isn't it? Right? All the people who were learning things from him ultimately raised him to deification status. They pushed him past beyond what he truly was. And in a way, when we do that, when we raise our heroes up, when we put them above mortal men, when we give them a status for which they are not entitled and did not want, we actually rob them of something. Because what's really cool is when we humans do stuff. It doesn't, we, we, don't, we expect deities to act and do certain things and to perform greatness. It's only special when people do it, right? We do things and that is good. Right? So when we objectify people to the point of making them deities, we take away their accomplishment because deities cannot fail. Make sense? Anyone? Okay. So we're going to talk about that. So, Steve Jobs. Now, Buddha, ultimately, this is a temple. This is a golden statue. I was in Bangkok a few years ago, and this is a Buddhist temple in Bangkok. It's filled with them. There are 10,000 Buddhist temples. This man, Buddha, who had a philosophy, who did not want to be worshipped. His true intellectual contribution to mankind is diminished by this. Now, what is Buddha reduced to? We've got suburban hipsters taking Pilates classes, sink, sipping soy lattes, and feng shuiing themselves into oblivion, thinking that they've added meaning to their lives in the process of it. Buddha's statue has been reduced to that of garden gnome, who has a little Buddha? <laughs> Who has their little Buddha sitting in their front yard by a fountain for the birds to perch upon? Yes? Who has a little Buddha, green colored ceramic statue, probably made in the Philippines, sitting on a bookshelf, and somehow that makes them more spiritual? It raises, that diminishes the debate, it does not raise the debate. So we're going to talk a little bit about reducing, stepping away from the glare, not trash talking Steve Jobs, but putting him in a little bit of context, and then putting ourselves in that context too. That's the whole point here. So let's talk about your boss. It's more fun to talk about bosses. Your boss 
is trying to be Steve Jobs. Yes? Anybody experienced that? Ever had a boss walk up to you recently and say, we need to focus on the details. We need to worry about the little things. We need to think differently. Right. Do they, do they succeed in that? Or does nine times out of ten, when they are thinking differently, they're just thinking in the same box as everybody else? It's not his fault. Not his fault. Let me tell you why it's not his fault. I did this search just two days ago. Steve Jobs. Amazon. Books. 10,955 entries. I did the same search for Gandhi. Got 9,500. So, Steve Jobs, he demand. Gandhi, not so much anymore. Yes? You agree with that? Do you agree with, you agree with that? Oh, wow. Okay. So, we'll talk later. A little, his, little history lesson, some colonialism history. It'll be great. Okay. So, you got these two disparities, right? We've raised him up. These books are marketed to who? Or to whom? Your boss. Because they're all trying, everybody wants to be Steve Jobs. And i got to tell you something else. Let's avoid the hypocrisy here. You do too. You want to be rich and influential, and you want to think differently, and you want to do brilliant design, and you want to be known for all those things Steve Jobby-ish. You want to have those for yourself. So it's not surprising that your boss does too. And he's given all these books. They're all targeted directly at him. They're there to convince him that he can pr present, like Steve Jobs. I'm missing my turtleneck, <laughs> right? You can, he can present like Steve Jobs. He can manage like St Steve Jobs. He can think differently like Steve Jobs. He can do all these things, and he will get some of that radiated Shekinah glory will reflect upon him, and he will be Steve Jobish by reading those books. It's not his fault. Think differently. How can is it possible to think differently? How can you learn to think differently from a book? Any one of these books that he's buying for $2.95 on Kindle, how can those teach him to think differently? Yes, here's, the, here's what they're saying. Here, sir, think differently by reading the same book as 10 million other people. You think differently by being exactly the same. I guarantee you that somebody is going to think differently, but it's not going to be somebody who read one of those books. And I got a little, another little secret for you. The next guy to revolutionize something, he's going to be thinking differently, all right, but it's going to be very different from Steve Jobs. It's not going to be the same. Present like Steve Jobs. This one drives me crazy. Who knows who, who, knows who Jerry Spence is? A famous attorney. Anyone? Jerry Spence. Famous defense attorney, never lost a case. He wrote a book. That book was called How to Win Every Argument Every Time. He never lost a case. Quite an accomplishment. Either he's picking his clients very well or he's just that good. And a good chunk of his book, if you can wade through the steeped arrogance and legalese, if you can get through all that, there's some tidbits in his book that are actually very valuable to me. He talks about being believable. Now, let me give you an example of that. When I give a presentation, I break every rule. Did anybody else take presentation in college as part of their curriculum? I break every rule. I come out, I talk to individual people. I walk around too much. I use inflections too much. I use my hands too much. I don't stand at the podium. I rock back and forth sometimes. But I got to tell you, this is me. Ask anybody who's ever worked for me. This is how I talk in the office. I'm the same guy whether I'm here or I'm there, right? I've got to be authentic to me. I see tons of presentations where people are giving product launches. Oh. You know, uh, Steve Jobs, he's got the turtleneck on, he's got the thing, and the he's got the presentation out there, he's got that little delivery mechanism, and I always know it comes off a little bit false. Doesn't it come off a little bit fake? When you know they're acting, you know they're not doing what they do. Something in your brain says, don't believe him. It doesn't matter what he's saying or how true the facts are, or you're verifying everything on Wikipedia or whatever. Something in your brain is saying, this guy's not telling me the truth, or not the straight scoop something between you and them. You can't present like Steve Jobs. Only Steve Jobs can truly present like Steve Jobs because he was being Steve Jobs. Right. Focus on the details. This one gets me every time. Focus on the details. Everyone thinks that was the magic, right? That was the magic. But the, true, the reality is he focused on the right details. Who knows Steve Jobs' famous thing he did with Adobe Flash? What was that? Who knows it? 
Come on. Anyone? He kicked it out of the product. The entire tech community told him it had to be there or he was going to freaking fail. And he said, no. He said, tell Adobe, in a famous letter, it's available online. He said, tell Adobe that I'll include their product when they make a better product. <laughs> he had another tech giant, and you had the, in every technological press said, people want this. And he just said, no. He didn't focus on that detail. He chose well. He made some decisions. How can you focus on the details if you don't know the details to focus on? That is all part of the mythos. And so any book that tells you that's marketed, Steve Jobs, learn how to focus on the details. It's a waste of time. It's a waste of money. But your boss is buying these books. So my ultimate proof. I'm going to prove my concept here. I've just, just displayed a thesis for you, an hypothesis. I'm going to prove it. Where is uh, the Steve? Who's this? Stephen Hawking. Stephen Hawking. We all know him. He's iconic. Another, another physicist, not Stephen Hawking, made an observation. And we're going to talk about that for a second. Almost by definition, I'm going to assume that the vast majority of us are sci-fi fans. Anyone? <laughs> yes? It's incumbent. Yes, you can you're just denying it. You're just in denial, sir. Right? You got that whole Spock thing going on your forehead. It's great. I, you're, we're there. I, I, brothers. Okay. Here's the deal. We're sci-fi fans, right? Okay. Time travel is something that is incumbent in virtually every sci-fi novel series or movie series, time travel worms its way in there, right? Yes? It's a wonderful plot device. Well, the, a physicist got up in there and he said, well, the proof that time travel is not possible and never will be possible at any point in the future is the fact that there are no time travelers here now. The blinding logic of that smacks us in the forehead and we deny, but, 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 but Kirk said, no, doesn't make a difference, <laughs> right? If you whip around the sun at the right speed, it warps. No, that doesn't. Ha the proof that none of that will happen is that there's no time travelers here. So Stephen Hawking did something great, proving that even the brilliant physicists have a sense of humor. He threw a party. Not 2006, I believe, was their year in Oxford University. He sits on the Newton chair at Oxford. Okay. Well known. He had it published in all the academic physics journals. He threw a party just for time travelers. Very exclusive announced where it was going to be, gave longitude, latitude, everything else, and published it out, had it etched on a stone tablet, set in the ground at Oxford University, and then he wheeled himself into this room with a private party, had canapes and champagne and all these fine festivities for time travelers. The time of the party came and went. He was waiting for a TARDIS or a Stargate to open up. I got laughs because they were lying when they said they weren't sci-fi fans. You notice that? Okay. Some TARDIS to appear, Doctor Who to step out, Stargate to flood the place with light. Nothing happened in darkness, thus proving his hypothesis. He said, surely, if time travel were possible, this would be the time somebody would show up to speak with the leading physicist of the day in the present. So my proof that you can't manufacture another Steve Jobs is there are 11,000 books and other items for sale on Amazon promising to make a Steve Jobs of you. Their date goes back 20 years. Where is the next Steve Jobs? Point him out. He doesn't exist. So the proof that those books don't work is that they're out there, they've sold millions of copies, and there are no more Steve Jobses. That's the proof of my hypothesis. So Clarity Dime, Steve Jobs is awesome. Who has an iPhone? I just filmed you on an, I on an iPhone to start this whole thing out. Everybody? Yes? iPad, I got one in my case. Yes? Did great things. But when we're studying, Steve Jobs is a case study for us. He is not the end all beat all. Your boss doesn't know this yet. He will. Sometime next year or the year after that, there'll be a new technological wonder. So some wonder boy will pop up and innovate the world. His picture will appear on Time magazine. He'll be photographed for U.S. News and World Report, if that's still around, and for other archaic publications. He'll be profiled on Forbes. He'll be put on CNN Money Talk, and he will be the next golden boy. And your boss will come to work the next day with a brand new set of buzzwords for buzzword bingo, and you'll have a new chart to make out for the next meeting. 
right? But really, when you're looking for your examples, you need to look for all the successes and all the failures. You have as much to learn from the fall of BlackBerry as you do from the rise of the iPhone. You have as much to learn from the fact that IBM has reinvented itself as a company six times that I'm aware of. They made adding machines, then they made typewriters, then they made PCs, then they bombed the PC business and they made mainframes, and they bombed the mainframe business and then reinvented the mainframe business, and now they just do services. They have reinvented, they, they, have, they have led the market fallen off a cliff, led the market, fallen off a cliff six times in the history of that company. There was as much to learn from how IBM reinvented itself as from the rise of Apple. Back to your boss. We talked about his catchphrases and buzzwords. The next time he's coming to you and he's saying, we need to think differently, have a little bit of empathy and forgiveness because a part of you wants to use those buzzwords too. Part of you wants to be Steve Jobs. The same way I want to be the bass player for B.B. King. It ain't going to happen just anytime soon. Right? So have a little bit of empathy. But you say, but, 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 Jeff. He's talking to me about design like he knows what he's talking about. He wants to put fuzzy kittens on the website and have them dance across in animated GIFs. <laughs> he thinks he's Steve Jobs. That's my job. I, I went to design school. Right? Let me give you the upside to all this. The upside to all this is that he cares about design now. I maybe have the advantage or disadvantage of being 48 years old, about to turn 49. I've been in technology for more than 20 years. I remember when nobody gave a rat's bazinga about design. People would come in and say, it doesn't matter what it looks like. It doesn't matter how easy it is to use. It doesn't matter. So if we're looking for one thing to be grateful for, something we can probably do, can attribute to Steve Jobs, is that he's made people care. So who, who in the audience has some sort of a career in design, art, or user experience? Okay, by the way, every hand should have gone up. All right. We think that way now because 20 years ago, that was the definition of thinking differently. 20 years ago, that wasn't in anybody's thought. Look at control alt delete. How does that make any sense? <laughs> User experience and usability was not a consideration. It was all about power. Dig up, you, know, so you can search online and you can find computer ads from the 80s and the 90s. Yes, they had computers there. Don't look at me that way. Yes, all right? They printed out on stone tablets, but, but it was a good thing. All right, so back in the day, computers were all about processing speeds, gigahertz, RAM, hard drive size, right? That was it. That's all you got. Now, we, the whole world, thinks differently. But that, we can't think, that's not thinking differently anymore. The next round of thinking differently will be something different. And with that, thank you for this morning. <laughs>